We're going to talk about the coming cyber wars and what's going on with these little devices we carry around in our pockets. And some people call them telephones. Some people call them mobile devices. I call them computers. And we are migrating our entire world to this space. And we got to think back with the problems that we're going to be seeing. Where have we been for the last 30 or gray hair, Hans and me, 40 years playing with these things? We've seen growth. We've seen the change in technology occur very, very quickly. And what does everybody always say about security? What do they say about security? Don't need it. Don't need security. It doesn't matter. Back in 1990, I testified before U.S. Congress, Canadian Parliament, U.K. Parliament, all across Europe and Asia, talking about the problems that we were going to have with privacy, with corporate security, and finally with what we're seeing today, true cyber war with nations. And what did everybody say? Too expensive, it doesn't matter, it's not going to happen to me. And now we look around us and the world has definitely changed. When we have a prime minister running his country from an iPad on an open Wi-Fi connection at Kennedy Airport, we know the world has changed. Some of the things that we've got problems with are all about explosive growth and what we call in the United States consumerization of the enterprise, taking essentially toys and now making them part of our corporate networks and our government networks. How many are there now, what is it, 600 million maybe now? And we're going to be seeing at the end in two years, two and a half years, we'll be seeing almost two billion two billion of these devices connecting to our networks. But of course, there are no security problems, are there? Are there any security problems? No, none whatsoever. But we do know that viruses have already been put and shown to work on these devices. We've been seeing the jailbreaking. We've seen already the researchers showing how are the bad guys going to use these devices the same way that they are now exploiting the weaknesses and vulnerabilities inside of the conventional computers. We already know that botnets, the proof of concept of botnets in mobile devices and iPhones has been done in the laboratory. How much longer before the criminals or maybe even the Chinese start using these against our networks and our infrastructures. We see entire industries that are now specially designing software for spying. And just as now you can buy root kits, you can buy entire hostile attack suites for your PCs and your Linux boxes, we're starting to see these in the mobile world as well. And have, if you've been following the quote-unquote cyber war between the United States and China, China in 1998 declared war on the United States. Many people don't recall this. The PLA, the People's Liberation Army, published a document called Unrestricted Warfare. And they said... In a conventional war with the West, we will lose. In a nuclear exchange with the West, we will lose. Therefore, we are changing the rules of warfare. And we now declare the critical infrastructures and the economies of the West to be legitimate targets of war. So they've been changing the rules and we're seeing this going on. And many of us warned 20 years ago, this is what's going to happen. And our governments, all of our governments said, no, 
don't worry about it. Besides, we don't understand computers well enough. So it must not be true. So what we have is coming along the perfect storm with these devices. We move more and more away from the fixed enterprise, the desktops, into these mobile devices, and they are going to get more and more powerful. So we're going to have billions of endpoints. How many exactly? Perhaps 20 billion by 2020, by some estimates. We have essentially an insecure infrastructure, the backbone of all of the communication networks around the world. They have availability security, yes. They have QoS, yes. They do not have confidentiality and integrity modeling built into it, an insecure fundamental framework. Then we've got users. Users are very smart people, aren't they? Show of hands. My users are really smart. Nobody. Not one user is smart. And then we have bad guys who are smart. And these bad guys have some of the same skills you have. Sometimes they're better skilled, sometimes not as good, but they have money. They have resources. They have time. And they can test things invisibly from around the world, and they're coming to the mobile space. So we're going to talk about, first of all, the top ten mobile issues we need to think about. And the first one is forget the past. Forget about it. The rules are different with these devices. The way we used to think about security will not work in this space, will not work with these devices at all. We need to look at things from a different perspective, a new view that will take into account that these devices are not professional devices. They are amateurs. They are toys. They are for the consumers. Yet every enterprise around the world is seeing them come in. The executives say, I want my iPad. The users saying, I want my iPad. Two or three people say, I want my my BlackBerry. Any BlackBerry users? Where's my bla where, where's my rim job? <laughs> there he. <is. laughs> we were having fun last night talking about that. What we're used to doing is on the left, and what we are needing to be doing is going to be on the right. In the U.S. alone, at Los Angeles Airport. LAX, 600,000 lost mobile devices every year. Around the world, millions. And they just throw them away. 20,000 taxi cabs, sorry, 20,000 mobile devices in taxi cabs in London lost in six weeks. And so we're dealing with very small things with corporate data, personal data. And so we have new considerations as we try to get these devices to work with the enterprise. These devices are cool. That's simply it. The demand when the iPhone came out, they changed the world. And suddenly everybody wants an iPhone. And then Android comes along and uh, I, I guess is Windows still in business? Does Windows still have anything mobile? No, of course not. And Symbian, as we say in the U.S., Symbian drank the Kool-Aid. And we will see. But BlackBerry did it right. BlackBerry introduced 10 years ago the Bez server. They did some stuff very, very right, looking at the enterprise market. However, BlackBerry isn't cool. No offense to my BlackBerry friends, but I am. Uh, this is the general view and what we're obviously seeing. So we're consumerizing these enterprises with devices that inherently cannot be secured. Attack vectors, completely different. 500,000 apps sit in app stores. 
How many of them are good apps? Anybody know? How many of them are good apps? A few, he says. How many of them are bad? A lot of them are bad. We do not know. And no offense to Apple, even though Apple gets mad at me for saying this, they do not do code review. They do not take the software apart, the app apart, and look inside to see what it's doing. They make sure that it does what it is advertised to do. Does not look for hostile code. Does not look for a time bomb. It does not look for Trojans. Because that is really, really hard to do. So right now we look at app stores as being the most efficient hostile code delivery system ever invented by man. And from an enterprise view, do you allow, do you want to allow your users in your fixed enterprise to download applications from the internet? Most companies say, no, it cannot be trusted. But now I have 5,000 of these between Android and the App Store, and I'm now going to allow those to connect to my networks. That makes a lot of sense to not too many people. These operating systems are really different. Number one, they're single user environments. I cannot have multiple users with different identities on these devices right now. These are personal devices, one ID per device, which changes many of the rules because effectively you are always in admin mode. You have full control. And that is part of what Steve Jobs and Apple really wanted and what Google is trying to do, give the user total control. But users are really smart, right? So we're giving really smart users complete control and access to 500,000 apps that are unknown. And it only gets worse from there. Security, over the years, we put on antivirus, spam detection, spyware detection, a personal VPN, a personal firewall, and we add all of these pieces of security software to a desktop or to our laptops in the conventional operating systems. Now, if I take this same approach and I do that to my smartphone, what happens to my smartphone? It's not running anymore. I could not say it any better. It's, you're going to brick it. Does brick it translate to you? Turn a, turns a phone into a brick. It becomes useless. The approach that we have taken since the 1980s will not work on these devices for lots of reasons. Battery usage and then the cost of the bandwidth. Up in the data usage to keep updating. Ultimately, this approach is not going to work. Yet some companies are still, the antivirus companies are actually doing some of this, and most security people recognize that is not a very good approach. Now, looking at what do these devices provide natively, there is a thing called MDM, Mobile Device Management. And in the case of Apple, they say, that is our security. All right. What it can do is have active sync. It has password enforcement. There's a few kind of cool things that it can do. However, is that security? Does that provide compliance? Does that meet ISO 27000 standards in any way for enterprise use? And every professional knows the answer, of course, is no. It does not. But worse, MDM, with two clicks, can be turned off by the user. So what good is MDM if the user can bypass security controls? Why allow that device to connect to the enterprise? Because the users want it, and the executives want it. 
So some people take the approach of sandboxing, and last night over only one or two beers with some of our friends somewhere, where, wherever we were, we were talking about sandboxing. And there's different kinds of sandboxing, and it means different things to different people. In the mobile world, there are some companies that are saying, oh, we will secure this consumer device to the enterprise using a sandbox. And that means that they have a custom application that they have to download. Then they have to have custom email, custom browser, use the VPN, hopefully that's native. Windows has no VPN in current Windows Mobile 7, so forget them. Symbian's out of business, doesn't matter. Now here's the problem. In your fixed enterprise, in your offices, would you be happy only securing this amount of the computer? Is that the approach that we currently take? No, we want the entire box locked down as BlackBerry does with its model. Complete device lockdown is generally what policy says is going to work. The other problem is the user has to be smart enough to use this. And he has to learn all of these new pieces of software inside of the sandbox. And as you'll be hearing from other speakers this week, there are questions about the security of sandboxes. Because if I am a bad guy, and I know that half of the world is using sandbox security to protect these devices, where am I going to attack first? I'm going to find the problems in the sandbox. So again, this model is something that I certainly do not endorse. And uh, it's a legitimate debate. And hopefully over the next two days, we can have discussion over some of these issues. Just because I am up here does not make me right. It makes me a big mouth. That's all. Management and cultural issues. We were talking about that with my uh, rim job friends last night. Are these personal devices? Are they corporate devices? Are they government devices? Are they both? And this becomes a cultural issue inside of corporations. I want to bring my personal device into the company. The company wants to lock the device down. To do that, the company then will see all of my personal traffic. Is that good or is that bad? If I have 10 different companies and I ask that question, I'm going to get 10 different answers because the cultures, not only within the United States, but around the world, every culture has a different view. Not only the national culture, but the corporate culture. How much privacy versus how much security, how much control, can I read personal emails, etc. So this becomes a, a very difficult thing, and many companies have taken the BlackBerry approach. These are corporate devices, period, end of story. Now they're obviously going to be starting to look at how to do some other things with it, with the new tablet. What's the name of the tablet? Playbook. I'm advertising for RIM here. I can't believe it. <laughs> and so they're looking at these dual-use mechanisms as well. How do you use them both for corporate use and personal use? And this is part of the policy thing that you are going to have to work with within your organization, whether it's a private company or a government. Some people say, well, before we decide to do security on our iPhones, we have to do a risk analysis. I say, bullshit. You've already done the risk analysis. You know the answer. You did it 10 years ago with BlackBerry. You did it with your PCs. You did it with all of your existing equipment. You know the risk, and the, this risk with mobile is worse. Because of lost devices, 
and some of the other physical issues that go with it that I talked about. You know the risk. You have to take proactive, an active approach to looking at this. The risk does not change. Ultimately, as BlackBerry has done, when it comes to iPhones and Androids, security is going to have to move to the cloud for the enterprise. It's going to have to move up there because the device cannot do it. Cannot do it, and we do not want the users involved. We want the users as removed from security as possible and enforce policy through lockdown controls. No magic here at all, except it's an exceedingly difficult thing to do, and that's why BlackBerry is in the lead and owns that piece of the market right now. So what do I do? Well, first of all, I need some goals. And generally, is there any reason why your mobile enterprise should be any less secure than your fixed enterprise? You're still running a business. You're going to be deploying applications. They're going to be accessing corporate resources, government resources. The military is going to be using these devices. Should the mobile enterprise be any weaker? I argue no. Compliance, whether it's privacy compliance, financial compliance, ISO standards, Many companies have to follow compliance guidelines, and if they are going to be doing business in a mobile infrastructure, they have to do the same level of security and compliance in the mobile that they do in the fixed. And this is centralized administration. Again, no magic here. We've been doing it for 20 years. And ultimately, you do not want the user to be able to bypass controls. Very, very simple concepts, very, very simple goals, well-defined, yet hard to do. Because these devices do not want to be secured. So, what do we do? There's ten things, ultimately, that I like to see in a mobile enterprise from a security standpoint, at least today. Now, this may change next week. It may change next month or next year as these devices mature as they get more sophisticated and as they add more features, then security will suffer. But the first thing is a lockdown. BlackBerry's known this for 10 years. Enterprise has known this for 10 years for their mobile devices and for their internal devices and for their laptops. This is not any magic whatsoever. And ultimately, I would like to be able to use a certificate of authority in order to have the trust, centralized trust, going out to the mobile devices. No magic, not easy to do. Second thing, and again, credit to my friends at BlackBerry, and always on VPN. How many of you have been to hacker conferences and had your password stolen and are willing to stand up and admit it? Now oh, that was almost a hand over here. Wi-Fi at airports, at hotels. How many of you use Wi-Fi? And how many of you have a personal VPN? All right, so not enough of you. Why don't you have a personal VPN? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Before I came over here from the States, I said, I better up, uh, re-up my VPN license because I'm coming to a hacker conference, of course. Always on VPN solves a ton of problems. Again, my friends at BlackBerry know this. All traffic encrypted stops a ton of problems over data. And over the data, we are using these devices more and more for VOIP, for Skype, for our corporate communications. Now, do I take all of those applications and put them into this sandbox? Or do I have it all native on the device that I like. Again, this is part of the debate that we currently have. Other thing I want is a firewall. Now, how do I do it in the enterprise now? I don't have personal firewalls sitting on every desktop and every laptop. 
I have centrally managed controls over processes, over ports, over application, what comes in, what goes out. Should I not have the same capability in my mobile enterprise? My answer is, of course, if it's an enterprise device, yes, I have to have the same level of control. The content filtering gets kind of interesting. I don't want to tell you that you cannot surf porn at work. If you want to, that's fine. You surf, you surf, you surf porn. I saw you nodding. Okay. What's your name, sir? Joyce? And you surf porn. I'm sorry. <laughs> but filtering is it's an important consideration for not only the enterprise, but for cultures. And in some cultures, uh, porn, you, you get your hand chopped off. Uh, in other places, they say, we do not want our users gambling. We do not want them using uh, um, auction sites. So I ultimately want to have a good degree of filtering control as part of my firewall enforcement. Simple. I do it in the enterprise now. I want to do it as well for all of my mobile devices. Now, this gets really interesting. These devices are truly mobile. Yet over the last 30 years, we haven't had to think mobile. It's a, I got it on my desk. It's on his desk. I don't have to think mobile. But these devices move all over the world. Now, I don't know if this happens over here, but in the United States, many companies that do business, and I'm going to pick on China here, when they go to China, they take away their BlackBerry and they give them a brand new, clean, sanitized phone with no information on it and no access to corporate resources for obvious reasons. We used to do that to France too, but that's another story. So these devices are mobile. Should my policies my firewall and filtering policies be the same all over the world? Or should they be able to be changed depending upon where I am? The rules in the Middle East may be different than the rules in China. Or perhaps doctors. I have one set of rules in the hospital. Another set of rules when I leave the hospital. Soldiers. I want to have my rules set that there is no GPS while I am in Afghanistan, but it's okay when I'm back home in the United States or Canada. The rules should be able to be set, all the filtering rules, all the firewall rules, based upon the actual location of the device automatically without the user getting involved. When it lands, it all ought to change. Antivirus, phishing, spam. We, we know we can't do it on the device, but all we, we know this space really, really well. We've been doing it a long time. Apply the same rules we use in the corporate world on the mobile devices because the phishing attacks, the spam attacks, the hostile link attacks. I won the Brazilian lottery. An African widow wants to give me $10 million. They're all coming to these devices as well. And the users, what do they do? They click. Yes, I want the lottery money. Yes, I will help you with your African money. And it's our job to help the user help himself. So same rules. Uh, device management. Here is the key. I was talking about MDM earlier. An MDM is removable by the user in the iPhones, specifically by the rules that Steve Jobs wants. However, there are certain techniques that when combined with all these other things I've been talking about, if MDM is attempted to be removed by the user, we create 
what is called a remediation. We detect it, and then the administrator should be able at that point to do something. Send an email, slap him on the wrist, disconnect the device from the network because he was bad. Take some action based upon what the user did. So device management can be locked down through the effectively an intrusion detection system that monitors everything that goes on on the device even without an application running on it. There are some cool tricks to do this. Now, we talked about the 500,000 bad apps out there. Well, maybe it's 490,000 good ones and 10,000 bad ones. Hans, how many of the Google apps have been hostile, called hostile in the last few weeks? Was it a couple 300 so far? So Google has said, okay, these 300 apps are bad. How many of you use fire, uh, Angry Birds? Okay. In the U.S., everybody uses Angry Birds. Do you have a good Angry Birds or a bad Angry Birds? You don't know. Why not? What about your users? Do they use good Angry Birds, bad Angry Birds? How about everybody know what a flashlight application is? Do you have the good one or the bad one? You have the bad one, right? Does the user know? Should the user even have to know? And this becomes something else that we need in the mobile environment more than ever, is what is called application awareness. Number one, Google, at least right now, is starting to list known, these are bad apps. Stop them at the server before they ever come down. But the other part of application awareness, some people might be call, call it intrusion prevention, intrusion detection. Uh, we call it apps behaving badly. When the application tries to break through memory calls, when the application tries to move things outside of conventional MDM, there's several sets of rules of behavior that are well known in the mobile world that you do not want to happen. You do not want the users' devices doing these things. So that's application awareness. Some occurs inside the device, some occurs at a server level, and it's gonna grow over time. And what we're gonna see, I believe, is effectively enterprise app stores that these devices will only be able to load down what is approved by the enterprise, which is exactly what we're doing now with our fixed enterprise. Are all users going to be happy with this? No. But it's necessary if we are going to maintain security and compliance at the enterprise level. If you jailbreak your device, the administrator should know about it and do something about it. If you try to do hacking from your device, the administrator should know what you've done and then take an appropriate action. And this is exactly what we do inside of our fixed enterprise now. We look for behavior. The user behavior, whether it is stupidity or it's hostility effect is the same. And the administrators of these mobile devices need to be able to identify what happened and take appropriate action. Lastly, do not change, that's the new iPhone over there, that's going to be the new iPad 5. Do not change the user experience. These devices are popular because of the user experience they present. And the iPhone changed the world, and Google's trying to do something, uh, except there's 200 different versions of Android on all of these platforms, which is becoming a nightmare for security. 
So our friends at RIM have introduced an alternative, and we're seeing this whole world change very, very quickly. But ultimately, it is about the user experience, and this is why sandboxing is not going to work. This is why the applications that are on our phones need to be able to function as they were designed to do, and I should be able to have a Lotus Notes client. I should be able to have any sort of client that ties to my servers with my existing infrastructure and not change the user experience. So those are the things that we look at from the mobile world as to how, where the problems are and an approach to solving these problems. Now, how does this affect some defense organizations? And the defense organizations include private enterprise. The bad guys are coming. You know they're coming. You know your users are not terribly smart. And they don't care about security. They do care about privacy. Now, in the US, 20 years ago, when I was talking to the Air Force and the military about cyber war, they said, if it doesn't explode with a bomb, we don't care. But now we see cyber commands all over the world recognizing, finally, that this is a new form of warfare. And the Obama administration now says, if you attack our power grid, we're going to bomb you. Almost, a little bit. But it is allowing for military doctrine to respond to significant cyber attacks against critical infrastructures. Now, in the private sector, some companies do have a strike-back policy. If you attack our company, we will attack you. Is that good? Is that bad? Well, it becomes ethics. It becomes law, or I have a set of servers in another country that I can deny that I own. Lots of ways people are playing the game. But we need to look at this as a national defense issue, whether it's for critical enterprise or the governments. And we call it CND and CNA, Computer Network Defense versus Computer Network Attack. And the tools are not any different just because we're in the mobile space. The tools are the same. The bad guys are the same. But the problem is worse because I was doing a TV demonstration for uh, a, a TV show in the United States a few weeks ago. And we were talking about GPS. And I had my Android. He says, show me how to turn off GPS. Well, I use GPS for when I'm driving. And I said, well, let me show you. It's really easy. And I'm poking and I'm poking. Seven layers down, turned off GPS. Can a conventional user do that? I had trouble. I didn't know where it was. Bluetooth on and off. How many users know whether they're, what the default conditions are? Bluetooth on, Wi-Fi on, off. These are all attack vectors that we turn off in our conventional enterprise and our conventional computers. What about our mobile devices? Now, the CNA, right now we've got a billion users on the Internet, approximately. Intelligent devices, portable computers in our pockets, billions and billions of them, Attackers are going to be smart. GPS is going to be off. They're going to hide behind HideNet. They're going to have the hidden botnets, just as they're doing in fixed enterprise, except they're going to be on the move all of the time. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to national defense? What does it mean to critical infrastructure when you have an app that you use as administrative rights to be able to Fix something when you're not at work. These are the tools that we're going to be using more and more to maintain critical infrastructure. And these are the targets. So that is some highlights. 
the things that I've been thinking about for the last two years. And it's not easy, and the problems are both technical and cultural. And there is no one right answer for every company or every country or every organization. The rules are different, the policies are different, the needs and realities are different. But hopefully I've given you something to think about, some of the things that I've been playing with in my mind for a couple of years. And if you'd like to talk about it, uh, I'll be here for two days, very happy to agree with you, to disagree with you, for you to argue with me, and that's how we all learn. And I really appreciate your time very much. And if you have any questions, if we have a few minutes, I'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, I will see you in the break. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions, comments? How are we doing on time, Olivier? Okay. What time is it? Who has a watch? 10.15. 10, Perfect. Then we're on schedule. <laughs> questions, comments, thoughts, challenges? Anybody? Yes. I'm sorry. I can't see with the lights. Yes. Thanks. I've got a first question. It's about how do you deal with people who buy uh, iPhones, Androids, and so on for personal purposes and connect them to enterprise? Uh, the wish issue we have, for example, us, is that uh, such people don't... Uh, are not, uh, okay. The, those people are not okay with uh, the company controlling all emails because it's personal. So how you, do you deal with that? <laughs> All right, that, that is the cultural issue I'm talking about. There are d different answers. And Blackberry Rim guys, they know the answer. Corporations say, this is business, period, end of story. With iPhones, some companies are saying, if you want to use iPhones, then we are going to see your personal email. We're not going to look at it. But if you do something bad, then we may look at it. That's exactly what happens right now inside of a fixed enterprise. If you do personal email from work, the company should be able to read it. Now, other companies are finding, and I don't know if that's true over here, but in the United States, many companies are saying, it is cheaper for us to give everybody an iPad take away laptops and put a security shell over it and if they lose it, we can throw it away. It's fine. No problem. And in that case, the company device sets the rules. If you don't like that rule, don't work here or have another personal device. The other approach is called split tunneling where effectively on the device you have two separate VPN channels. One for all corporate work that goes into the corporate world through the corporate servers, and then a second one that has a VPN and the antivirus and all of that that goes through a personal server. From a security standpoint, I have a little problem with that, but some companies find that acceptable. So those are really the three choices you have. Uh, you, can, you can go the sandboxing route if you choose, uh, but sandboxing, whether it's a day or in a year, is going to break. Something is going to go wrong, and it's going to become very difficult. So the choices are limited, and it comes down to policy of the company, ultimately. Other questions, comments, please? Say tu. That's all? Okay. Yeah, but I know you, so. Hi. Um, do you find uh, disturbing or funny that uh, every smartphone uh, available now uh, does not include an uh, auto-update feature? A what feature? Uh, auto-update. In order to... Auto to yes. Uh, well, again, auto-update is... Um, <laughs> that's an interesting one. When version... 
1.00 of anything comes out, do you want it? Do you want 1.0? Show of hands. I want 1.0 of everything. All right. We have. Yeah, oh, thanks, Hans. Yeah, you want. Yeah, you want to screw with it is what you want. When there is a major update on an operating system, do you deploy it across your enterprise or do you put it into your laboratory first? You put it into the laboratory to find out what Microsoft screwed up. Just saying. You do not push it out. So my experience is most corporations do not want auto-update on their laptops or their desktops. So I would argue exactly the same thing here, that auto-update onto these devices should be turned off and be pushed through the enterprise app store. Now that being said, one of the advantages of having all of the security being run in the cloud is that I can update my signatures, my antivirus, all of my rules. I can update them a couple hundred times a day in the cloud, in the server, and never affect the device and never change it. Because sometimes the older version works much better. <laughs> So I, I'm not a fan of auto-update in an enterprise environment. Uh, I'm not a f I don't have it on my phone because I have been auto-updated and my phone has uh, bricked. So I, I, I just stick to it. It works. It works fine. Any other thoughts, comments, please? Otherwise, uh, I'll declare a break and uh, we will meet back in here. At, oh, another question. Thank you. Uh, I've got a concern with Apple uh, because they introduced a few days ago uh, iOS 5 and iCloud, which means everything goes back to Apple in their data centers, including corporate data, and uh, well, they seem to control everything. Mm -hmm. So how do you think it will evolve? Okay. Uh, he's asking about iCloud, which, uh, I, I, does everybody know that Apple has now been sued? Uh, they got sued two, three days ago by a company in Arizona in the United States by the name of iCloud. iCloud Enterprises is suing Apple for iCloud. This is going to be very interesting to watch. Now, I found, I think we talked about this last evening a little, if I remember after all the beers. At the WWDC, it was very interesting to look at where Apple's vision is. And I think it became very, very clear that Apple's vision is not with the enterprise. And when I saw iCloud, and I said, that is really, really cool for the consumer who has no idea what else to do. Because, uh, what was it, dot me? Was that the Apple one, dot me? What? Mobile me. That was a complete disaster and failure. But I knew a lot of people using it because they didn't have any idea how to use anything else. So if iCloud works as advertised, it's going to be really, really good until the Chinese hack Apple. and Or what Lulzsec goes after Apple. Having a single point of failure from a security standpoint uh, is something I don't like. I would not personally want to use iCloud, and especially if you notice, it's only five gigabytes. And you know who can live on five gigabytes these days? So you have what sixteen or thirty-two for your iPod alone. So. Uh, I, I think that it's going to be another overpriced consumer thing that may or may not work. I, I, I don't know. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to raise one more concern about the actual location where phones or mobile devices are being built. Uh, so we were talking about yesterday about the fact that in... Okay. Yesterday we talked about the... The fact that uh, there was some kind of press information of mobile devices being compromised right in the factory. 
uh, I think it was happening in Greece and it was happening with Motorola and uh, I don't want to be the devil's advocate here but uh, iPhones are being made in China and uh, you're talking about China a lot, we're talking about iPhones a lot. So what would you say are the implications of the possibility of having these devices pre-trojanized or pre-compromised by the factory itself? That, that, oh, that, boy, that's a big question. Um, for those of you that are old enough, other than me and Hans, back in uh, Novell days, Novell distributed diskettes with viruses. Uh, Intel did it. Um, Hayes Modem did it. A number of companies back in that day when we had diskettes, five and a quarter diskettes, they had that problem. Now, what you're referring to is what we called in uh, 20 years ago chipping, which is building hostile silicon with Trojan horses inside of it. And I respect exactly what you're saying. I understand it. In fact, Nokia even had some Trojans built into it. And I don't know, remember if I heard how that happened. But with Apple, I... Apple is a very different company. Apple, in many ways, it could be called a silicon Nazi. And they are such control freaks. They design the chips themselves. They, do, they control every single step of the process, much more so than many other companies. And they have made chips and consistently for many, many years, custom chips. Now, are they perfect? No company's perfect, but I think that of any of them, Apple may be such a control freak that they would catch it in the process or monitor the process every step of the way. Plus, the foundries that they use are different than their assembly plants. So they're using many, many different suppliers across China. Now, the foundries are in Taiwan. The assembly is over in China. So I have to imagine they're controlling every bit of the process. Maybe it'll happen. And if it does, Apple's in big trouble. Anything else? Again, thank you very much. And I'll be out in the hall and be happy to talk with any of you. Thank you and enjoy the conference.